So I think we may start. Can you all hear me? Yes, okay. So first of all, thank you uh, for being uh, with us on this uh, uh, webinar, uh, which is the, 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 the last one for the fall term. Uh, hosted and offered by Eden and NAP, Network of Academics and Professionals uh, from the European Distance and the Learning Network. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction related to NAP, uh, the Network of Academics and Professionals, and then I will leave the floor to our wonderful host today, uh, Tim Coughlin, uh, from uh, the Open University UK. Uh, so if you are uh, connected, please drag the uh, pink uh, arrow to the place where you are connected from so that we can uh, understand which is, uh, uh, where is the audience based uh, today. Anyway, you know that uh, the, um, webinar will be uh, recorded and you will find the recording on our website afterwards. Anyway, um, I'll start with my presentation. If uh, the Secretariat can show uh, the presentation, I will tell you uh, uh, some uh, brief information uh, related to uh, our network of academics and professionals and some other information related to the next and incoming um, uh, events uh, offered by uh, the NAP. I can see my presentation. Ah, here it is, here it is. Uh, so, uh, my name is Antonella Poce. I think you all know me uh, so far, and I come, I teach experimental pedagogy at the University Roma uh, 3, uh, that you see is indicated here. Uh, and I chair uh, the steering committee uh, of the network of academics and uh, professionals from the European Distance and the Learning Network. What is the NAP? Uh, it is uh, um, a network that supports individual members in the association, uh, provides uh, um, effective uh, uh, meeting and communication forum. That is our main uh, objective, uh, um, the one of facilitating interaction and communication among the membership. Uh, is con coordinated, as I was telling you, by a steering uh, committee, which is uh, elected by a ballot, uh, a ballot of uh, NAP members. And actually, um, you will see that in really these days, we will open uh, a new election procedure because this uh, steering committee, which is uh, indicated here, and that is the steering committee that is in, in charge at the moment, uh, will be completely uh, re-elected and changed. We are reaching the end of our mandate, so uh, it is time for anyone of you uh, who uh, is interested and is desiring to participate, to be active uh, in uh, Eden and in the NAP, especially to participate in the election ballot to, to uh, be part of the new, um, the new uh, NAP. Uh, as I was telling you, um, these are the main objectives uh, of uh, uh, being part and being active part of the NAP. Um, another important uh, role of uh, participating in the NAP is that of finding uh, partners, uh, start new research uh, consortia. So uh, it's it's very, very uh, productive being part of such a, a network. Um, there's, of course, a, a, a NAP 
members area in our website and you can connect here you can have a look at the, our um, area here uh, and the benefits as i was saying are different besides the one of being part of the community and participating with starting new uh, different uh, uh, projects uh, of course uh, you can um, delegate up to 30 uh, individuals in the NAP to uh, the, um, the um, conferences and all the uh, events that Eden organizes. Of course, you can attend conferences at the use fees. Um, uh, you have free access to electronic versions of Eden conferences proceedings. Um, you uh, can use, of course, the Eden logo and you get lots of, lots of information about uh, the community activities. Uh, and this is, uh, is actually a, a, a true uh, benefit. Uh, we try to, uh, as a steering committee, to uh, use different channels to establish this contact, this relationship that we, we, we need to, um, to support and which is productive for research, for, for development in the area of interest that we share uh, through different channels. First of all, um, the social media and the Eden chats. Tonight we will have uh, uh, an Eden chat at 6 p.m. Don't forget to connect. Uh, we work to support professional development and these webinars uh, on the themes of interest uh, are addressed to this main aim. Um, we try to work on the improvement of the website where the different information are, stores, are stored and of course we try to listen to uh, our members' uh, uh, idea. Uh, we also have uh, a strong connection with uh, uh, the um, Council of Fellows, that is another um, uh, network, uh, very important network within the Eden, which support us with their uh, ideas and uh, um, scientific direction, if we can uh, use this word. And uh, um, of course, we all share uh, as I was saying, the same uh, objectives and uh, the main opportunity to meet and interact uh, face to face are, of course, the um, annual conferences. And I'm very pleased to announce here our next uh, annual conference that is, as you can see, uh, focused on a very up-to-date uh, topic, Human and Artificial Intelligence for the Society of the Future, Inspiring Digital Education for the Next STEAM Student Generation. So, um, lots, lots of uh, very interesting uh, inputs will come out of that conference, I'm sure. And the conference will be held in Timisoara in Romania from June 21st to June 24th. So check the, uh, the website and uh, be ready to submit your uh, proposal and participate in the conference. Now, uh, I think that uh, um, here are other information to connect with us. Uh, here you have all uh, my details, so for whatever other uh, curiosity or, in, or interest, please uh, contact me. And now it's really time to leave the floor to Tim, and I, I uh, ask Tim to introduce himself and to start his contribution, which will be very, very uh, involving. Thank you so much, Tim. Right. I'll, uh, thank you. Um, can you hear me okay? Just checking. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Antonella. And, and thanks, everyone, for joining and, and listening. Um, I hope this is uh, an interesting um, talk for you. So, so a little bit of background. Uh, earlier in the year, um, I was asked to, to give a talk at uh, a conference on museums and accessibility. And actually, that's where we met Antonella. We were both giving uh, talks and 
the topic was around inclusive innovation, um, particularly in the museum space in that case. Um, but it's one of a, a few times recently where I've kind of started looking back over projects that either I've um, done or that have been done by my research group over uh, its history. So we were also involved in um, writing a book, which is kind of a retrospective on on the, the group, which should be out soon, um, and and things like that. So so it starts you thinking, which is I think really useful, is going back over. Uh, some past research projects and actually trying to define what it was that we were trying to achieve and the ways in which we achieved it. So, um, so I, I kind of developed this talk around some principles and some projects just to get thinking about that. And um, I'm very happy if people have questions or thoughts to put those in the chat box. Um, and as we go along, I can raise those or we can talk about them at the end. Um, so, as, as Antonella said, uh, my name is Tim Coughlin. I'm a lecturer in the Institute of Educational Technology, IET, uh, which is part of the Open University. Um, and actually, one of the projects I'll talk about here was from a prior role where I worked at the University of Nottingham um, on a, a large institute called Horizon, which looked at digital economy research. Um, but mostly, this is focused on the types of research we do in IET at the Open University. And uh, that really kind of comes from our uh, the Open University mission, really, um, to be open to people, places, methods, and ideas. Um, and really, as the, the mission suggests, we, we are aiming to provide high quality education to all who wish to have it. Um, and it's that message of inclusion, um, pedagogic innovation and partnership that really is part of what IET has done uh, for the past kind of 40 years, so so long before my involvement, um, but, but this has continued to be our, our aims. And so uh, to give a little background about what that means for our audience of, of students, um, we have currently 20,000 students declaring disabilities. So at any one time, we have that many students studying with us uh, who have uh, declared a disability of some kind to us. We're open to anybody regardless of their qualifications. So obviously, like um, other open universities, um, we don't look to have a, a set a bar for students to be able to join us, which is really important, but of course brings its own challenges in terms of preparing students and ensuring that they are able to study effectively. We also work with a lot of students in prisons and secure environments. Um, and a lot of our students combine work and study. So they're studying part time to maybe improve their lives or just to uh, understand a new subject while they work. And really that adds again to this idea that we need to develop people's confidence, study skills, digital skills, and these kind of things um, in ways that are probably true elsewhere in the HE sector, but it's maybe emphasized a little more for us. So as I said, I, I work in the Institute of Educational Technology, um, which has existed almost since the beginning of, of the university. So, so in the olden days, this was very much around how do we use uh, audio recordings or uh, TV broadcasts or all these kind of things. Um, and of course, with the advent of computers, that became uh, key to thinking about how do we innovate, how do we teach. Um, so our role really is, is guiding the OU in terms of harnessing technology and developing technology. Uh, we host a, a range of, of groups, uh, one of which is Open Education Research Hub. So that looks at OER and MOOCs and these kind of areas of education um, that are offered for free or lower cost. Uh, I work as part of the Securing Greater Accessibility uh, Initiative, which looks at how we support and improve support for disabled students. Um, we also have a learning and teaching technologies team, which are actually our development team. So they actually, we can uh, devise projects and have them work uh, to do software development and maintain tools for us. So all of that kind of means that for me and, and colleagues, um, we're quite interested in the idea of designing and, and innovating specifically for the ideas of inclusion and engagement. 
So it's about kind of creating innovations in educational technology, but that are really about how we can engage those kind of diverse audiences, perhaps underserved or um, audiences that are otherwise not being thought about, uh, being inclusive of everyone who wants to learn, thinking about pathways between informal learning and non-formal learning and formal learning. So we, not everything we do is about degrees. There's a lot of it about uh, you know, open educational resources and courses that people can take for free. Uh, we're very interested in areas around active learning, so getting students to create, do, share, these kind of things. And there's a big emphasis on encouraging reflection, so getting our students to think about their development, think about what they've learned, look back over what they've done. And that uh, really kind of Brought, was brought together for me in looking back on some of the projects we've worked on and looking at some of our current projects uh, was trying to, to think about some principles. So these will kind of be returned to um, in the talk, but just to, to kind of introduce here, um, there's three principles really. So the first one was to start with the audiences that face challenges, so actively looking for people and areas where there are problems but then actually taking that and using it as an opportunity to innovate more widely. So taking those things that we do for particular groups and then looking beyond them. The second one is to explore simple ways of getting people to be creative. So getting them to do things that are imaginative, creative, but not necessarily difficult. And that's about getting them to think about, to think about participation um and new ways of thinking and, and sharing and the final one is really to consider accessibility from the beginning of a, of a design process so rather than um building something you know very novel and innovative and then after we've done a lot of work to then go oh actually we need to make this accessible um rather than doing that to actually do it in a in a way that we think about that from the start so each of these principles I'll, I'll talk about uh, in relation to a particular project that we've done. So the, the first project uh, I'd like to introduce uh, was called Out There and In Here. And the, the sort of tagline for that project was social inclusion through distributed team collaboration. And this was a, a project that evolved from other work. So we're talking about that first principle here of, of looking for problems and challenges for particular audiences. And our challenge in this case was field work. Um, and actually, uh, this was an area that we found in our own teaching. Uh, we know that field work is important. We know that students uh, really uh, benefit from it. And in some subject areas, it's, it's really essential uh, that they, they have some experience of field work. But uh, it, it's also very challenging for students, particularly, say, with a mobility impairment, so a student who uses a wheelchair or uh, just has difficulty um, going into particular environments. So as you see in the photo, you know, field work might uh, occur in, in environments that involve of climb, climbing up hills and rocky faces, just to, in this case, you know, look at the geology of the area. And uh, this, the project out there in here, really emerged from previous work uh, that a colleague of mine, Trevor Collins, had led on. And this was actually look at integrating into our teaching, where students were expected to take part in field work, how a, a experience could be given to those students from a distance. So Trevor was setting up, and this is you know back in the in the early 2000s, um, setting up networks in a in a local area such that a student can uh, communicate with those who can go in and take photos of the rocks and the area, and can undertake those activities with that student. Um, and and if you can look at the photo on the right, that's a, a kind of a tutor and a student working in a car a little distance from from the field site. And so this project was called Enabling Remote Activity. And uh, as I say, my colleague Trevor uh, led on that. 
And then what happened was we kind of took that concept that you would have learners in uh, a field site location and other learners who might not be in that location for whatever reason. And you would look at this distributed collaboration and how that could be designed uh, to be equitable and to produce valuable uh, learning outcomes. So the important thing here was that we started with this group of students who had mobility impairments, but actually when we got to the Act There and In Here project, we looked at it more widely. And this was a project funded by uh, the Engineering Physical Sciences Research Council in the UK and in collaboration with Microsoft. And what we built in, in Out There and In Here was really extending that idea um, that we could have students in a field site and other students who could also get a useful learning experience by collaborating with those students. So in this slide, you, you can see the, the indoor space that students uh, were given to work in. And this was kind of set up like a command center. So they could see images of the field site. They could communicate with their fellow students in the field site. Uh, and what we tended to find was that these indoor students took particular roles. And then in contrast, we had another group of students with a tutor uh, working at a field site. So in this case, in this images, it's a, it's a kind of quarry where you can look at the uh, geology. And those students um, communicating with the indoor group, taking photos, sharing observations, these kind of things. And this was really interesting to us, um, partly as a, at the time, um, a complicated technology issue. So nowadays, you know, mobile networks are pretty good and cover most areas, um, depending on where you live. Um, you know, you, you could hopefully get a network and, and share these things. But back when we did this project, that, that was actually, you know, pretty difficult. Um, a lot of these field sites are quite rural. So there was a technical challenge uh, to enabling this access. Um, but what was really interesting actually was the pedagogical designs and activities we could create. Um, that the people in the different spaces actually had quite different abilities and opportunities. And it was about kind of designing that and thinking about how they can work together. So what we included really in a sense was that those, those out there learners in the field site um, really benefited from the information they were getting from the people indoors who could search databases, who could do identification for them. Um, those sorts of things quite easy easy for someone to do in an indoor space with laptops and other technologies. Less easy for people who are in an outdoor site with a small mobile phone um, and perhaps poor weather and other things like that. Um, so they played a very important role that was beneficial to those outdoors. Uh, the in-here learners, um, they got some engagement with this real world experience. So they weren't using artificial examples. They were through the, the proxy of the people in the field, they were experiencing field work. Um, but what we did find is those out there learners really had to help and take responsibility um, to create a good experience really for the people indoors. So where this sometimes didn't work so well was if the people out there sort of started forgetting about those people. But where it worked really well was where they took responsibility for that. And we, we continued with this concept, and so it wasn't just applied in, in the kind of geology space, we also applied it for historical uh, investigations. So this was an example where we had people in a, um, in, this was actually in, in Cambridge, historical sites in Cambridge, particularly um, a large kind of graveyard with lots of historical um, people uh, buried there. And we had a lot of data about that site that people indoors could uh, explore and then instruct and share uh, with the people outdoors walking around. So we could apply the same concept to quite a lot of different groups. So this was with school children, for example, rather than university students. And we built this, this concept of having students indoors and outdoors working together. Um, and that was you know, really interesting, not just because of the group around mobility impairment, who could obviously benefit from it, but from this, this wider group. So as I say, the principle there 
uh, was really to start with those audiences that face challenges, but then not to say, well, actually, the only thing we're interested in is helping those students with mobility impairments. We can actually take those concepts and be inclusive of, of wider audiences and innovate for everyone by, by having those starting points. I mean, so, so if anybody has any thoughts on that concept and whether it applies to your work, um, you know, very interested in any comments uh, you want to make in the chat. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll carry on and, and, you know, be interesting to hear your thoughts as we continue. So the second project um, and principle I'd like to introduce uh, was called Art Maps. And this is really where we're thinking about this kind of idea of creative engagement, and how we can create something that allows people to get creative in, in very simple ways. So Art Maps was a project which was really about working with galleries and museums uh, to think about what they can do with their data. So it was a, the Art Maps was a collaboration uh, between the University of Nottingham, uh, the Tate, um, which is, has galleries in, in London and other areas of the UK, um, and the University of Exeter. So it was it was quite an interdisciplinary project involving arts and humanities and computing, um, and, and obviously the gallery themselves and, and their uh, groups around learning and technology. And, and the background really to this, what was interesting to us was that um, the Tate were sharing open data uh, about their museum collection. So they collected this data uh, about all the artworks that they had, so thousands and thousands of artworks, um, and they were now sharing this under an open license. Uh, and, and that's become quite common now to share open data. You know, it's a really interesting idea. But really where it leads people is, well, if we share this data, what, what are people able to do with it? Um, what's the purpose? Um, and so for Tate, there was a lot of discussion about how do we produce something that gets the public to engage with that collection data. And one idea was that the public could help them improve on this data or augment this data uh, through some sort of crowdsourcing. So that was an initial kind of germ of an idea here. We're also interested in how that data could be used for learning and particularly to engage people who might not be in the gallery. So obviously Tate is, is geographically situated in certain places uh, and, and lots of the public are not nearby. So how can they engage with Tate and with Tate's collection? And uh, I mean, this is just some images. Uh, if you go to um, GitHub, which is, is a, a way of you know, sharing um, data and code, uh, you, can, you can get that data about the Tate collection. And you can also view it through their website so you can see all the artworks that they have and you can um, engage with it in that way. And uh, one thing that really interested us about this was the idea of location. So um, within Tate's taxonomy of data about their, their collection, they actually had a, a place for places. So which places were in related to that piece of art. And obviously this varies according to the artwork. Um, and what we did was start to explore how people thought about place in relation to particular artworks. So you see in these images here that uh, we had people walking around London and uh, while they were doing so, they were given various artworks that represented uh, the River Thames and, and talking about uh, doing you know kind of trails or walks around London thinking about art and place um, so in this case kind of thinking well what perspective was the artist looking at when they when they painted this or what was their thoughts about what it is they're trying to capture in that location so it started off with a lot of kind of low fidelity type events we hadn't built any technology at this point we were doing things on paper and getting people walking around um, and that, but that led us to the Art Maps uh, website, um, which you can go and visit online uh, and, and kind of see for yourself. Um, but I'll explain a little bit about what happened when we, we put this in front of people. And the idea of Art Maps was really to say that people could link the artworks in the collection to particular locations. So they, they were 
supported to say, oh, well, where do we think this artwork belongs? And some artworks obviously had location data, others did not. Um, so we started off you know, getting people doing this in, in various ways, so doing it outside, doing it in the gallery, so there's an installation uh, of, of art maps where people could do it on, on a screen whilst being inside the cake. Other people could use it on a mobile device and um, walk around thinking about locations and art. And it, the thing is, it's quite a simple idea, really. We're just saying, well, where does that artwork sit? Tag it to a location. But it, it creates these really big questions about what it means to put an artwork in a location, where an artwork really belongs. And uh, when we're talking about participation, who decides uh, if there's a correct location or what it actually means for there to be a correct location for an artwork in, in the world on the map. And to take an, to, uh, a few examples, so this is um, Turner's uh, painting of the Colosseum in Rome. And uh, you know, this is, this is a, a reasonably simplistic example. And we can see when people uh, used art maps, um, if you can see the image on the right, I'll, I'll explain it. They're basically uh, looking at locations and, and marking this as having a particular perspective on the Colosseum uh, as a location, so they kind of they have different ideas about which perspective it might be, but they're, they're quite um, similar. And actually, what we found when we asked people, a lot of them were going on to kind of Google Street View and sort of moving around the area of the Colosseum and thinking, well, what what angle? Where was he stood? And and is it a real kind of angle or is it a combination of angles? These kind of things. But it got people thinking. But it was quite a simple example. Um, and people were saying, you know, this is this is fun. Uh, it's like a treasure hunt. You know, I'm going around uh, on, on Google Street View on the map and learning about new places through thinking about the artworks that were painted there. So it was having a nice effect of engagement. Um, but obviously, a lot of artworks are not as uh, simple and, and pictorial as, as that one. So here's another artwork. Um, that gives a slightly different example. This is a, an artwork called Allegro Steppatoso uh, by the artist Carol Waite. And uh, it depicts a, a kind of fantastical zoo scene. Um, and, and you know, from looking at it, you're not entirely sure where this might be. Uh, and when we started talking to people, uh, they, they and, and looking at their suggestions, they, they said, oh, well, this, is, this could be Regent's Park Zoo in London, so a particular location. Um, and then they started thinking again, well, where exactly would we put this? Uh, they weren't so sure really with this. So somebody said the, the, the landscape seems to work, but it's hard to know, you know where this actually was. And um, it's interesting because what actually happened here is that people were looking at the information on the Tate website about the painting and about the artist. So they were learning that this artist had visited Regent's Park Zoo as a child. Um, and but of course this isn't an accurate picture of of the zoo, uh, but still people were saying, well, this is where it belongs. Um, but but they were also aware that the painter had not painted Regent's Park Zoo. Uh, so there was another quote here from someone saying that this is a this is a painting of an ideal zoo. It's it's not necessarily a real one. It's a it's a place in your mind. It doesn't exist. Um, and to take this idea further, uh, a, another artwork we got people to look at was Radio Wind Tires, which is by the artist Julian Opie. And uh, this is, is very much a, an artwork that plays with the idea of different places. So it's, it's depicting a, a motorway, really, um, which, which could be anywhere. And, and that's exactly what we saw. Um, people put this all over the world in different locations where they thought, oh, yes, that's that's where I think that picture belongs. So somebody was saying you can you can locate this through your own personal connections. Um, another person was saying, you know, I, I can think of a memory of mine that relates to this, um, but I've never put that on the map, and that's kind of interesting. So as I said, this this really kind of brings up the idea of where is an artwork? What does it depict? Where is it physically? Uh, where did the artist live? What does it remind you of? These are all kind of valid answers to where the artwork belongs. 
And this brought us back to various literature about the idea of being open to interpretation and actually allowing people to think rather than giving them simple answers. Um, and in this idea that, you know, from uh, Bill Gaver's work, um, thinking about ambiguity, this idea that there's no easy interpretation and it requires people to participate and really make their own meaning. So we thought this was really interesting because it's such a simple idea. You know, we're not asking anybody to do anything complicated and most of the people we ask could do it. But actually, it, it has a complexity to it um, because we're making them think. And uh, it's also relevant to inclusion and participation. So uh, Laurie Bird Phillips uh, wrote about uh, open authority in a museum. So really kind of taking the idea that somewhere like Tate um, has experts and curators and people who understand painting uh, and have spent their lives thinking about it. But is their view on where this artwork belongs any more valid than any member of the public view? So the idea of open authority um, is that you can use the web uh, and, and you can kind of don't forget about that expertise that people have about art, but you can allow people to really engage and feel like their view has meaning. Um, so you're no longer relying on uh, there being a fixed interpretation of what a piece of art is. And, and this is going to be really nice for including people in museums and, and including them in, in discussions of art. So, so you know, if we, if we think about the question of where is an artwork, really it's any of these places is, is valid. You know, there's not one right answer. And on our research, uh, this kind of led us to the idea of a spatial footprint of artworks. So really, artworks um, can be connected and thought about in terms of multiple relationships with different places. Uh, and, and actually, we can create technologies now, like art maps, that think about the relevance of space and place in relation to a, a museum collection. Uh, and that can also be very personal. So it's not about an answer that's correct for everyone, but an answer that matters to you and getting you to think about it. So the principle there, as I said, was to explore these simple and novel ways to get people to be creative. It opens up thinking and participation, and it can also be really inclusive because you're no longer saying there's a right answer and there's an expert who knows everything. You're actually saying, well, uh, there are many valid answers and you should be thinking about what this means to you. And uh, the third project and principle I'd like to talk about is that it's actually a more current project. So this is one we're still working on developing, and I hope it's, it's of interest to you uh, as much as it excites us. So this is a project called Our Journey. Our Journey is about allowing students to map their study journeys and represent the challenges and achievements that they've had. And so the principle here is about thinking about accessibility from the start. But equally, because this is a new project, I think it actually encapsulate, encapsulates the, the last two principles as well. So where did we start with this? Well, we did start with populations that face challenges. So we did participatory research with our disabled students group. So the Open University, as I said, has you know, 20,000 um, disabled students registered at any time. And the disabled students group is a really great uh, bunch of people that we work with. Uh, in terms of representing those people and thinking about what we can do to, to create inclusive innovation. Uh, and the exercise we did with them was really to think about priorities. So what were the big things they'd like us to do research on? Um, and a range of things came out of this. Um, there's some really interesting ones around how they found it difficult to get through processes that got them support or to allow them to register and understand what was available to them. Um, also, just the idea that diversity of student experiences wasn't really visible. And we kind of took that and thought about how we could create something that helped them to communicate and represent their experiences. Um, and, and, you know, we really found that people were saying, well, I, I want better tools to communicate with the university and give my feedback. 
and and for them to understand for my tutor say to understand me and who I am and so this was our starting point it was really I kind of think about understanding those challenges uh, and allowing the university to understand them and the university staff to understand and this was a, was a, again a very collaborative project. So we worked um, with our disabled students group, as I said. We worked with uh, Diverse to Nobility, or a great uh, social enterprise around uh, helping uh, train and support disabled students, and JISC, who are uh, funding us in this work um, and have a real interest in um, supporting higher education and areas like learning analytics, where we've been able to say, well, this is an alternative way of thinking about. Um, how we understand students. So we did a lot of participatory design work here. We were thinking about, you know, how would a student like to represent their journey? Um, where does their journey as a, as a learner begin? Uh, and how does that integrate the events in their life? Because things happen in your life that affect study. Uh, you know, you may have a job, you may have uh, family issues, things that happen to you. Those all impact on your study. So, so as we talked to people, it was very clear that they wanted us to include those kind of life events and the things that were happening to them in the study journey. And uh, the picture on the right is um, a snakes and ladders board. And, and we kind of got this from various sources that people kind of thought about being a student a bit like being in snakes and ladders. So this idea that, you know, you'd make some progress and sometimes you'd make amazing progress and everything would feel like you know you you'd just gone up a ladder and things were great and other times you you slip up and you you would fall back down again and feel like you've just gone back to the beginning so it was it was interesting that that came up a few times and this idea of sort of board games and things like that representing what it felt like to be a student and uh, so as I said we did a lot of workshops and and we developed various tools and uh, paper based tools again to to think about what what it meant to represent student journey and how we create a tool that helped and some other things that came out I mean, we, when we started this we were really interested in the idea of collecting and understanding the challenges students faced because we thought well that's why we can help you know the university better understands the problems students have uh, then then we can help them but actually, in terms of working with the students, they wanted to represent their achievements. You know, they really wanted us to allow them to have a more balanced view and say, well, actually, what are my goals? What am I trying to achieve here? The other thing they wanted was to not make it feel like another essay or assignment that, you know, another piece of work that we're making them do. So they wanted it to be fun and different and, and something that took them outside of study and, and what it actually meant you know to be completing their courses uh, and another really interesting thing was around sharing the journey um, and this idea that we wanted people to be honest about what it was like to be a student but if we wanted that they had to have some control over what they were sharing and uh, this has all led us to various iterations now and as I say this is ongoing work but we have this idea of students creating these cards which describe a particular event that happened to them so that could be anything like an assessment or getting a job or struggling with something and and they create these simple cards uh, which describe each of these events uh, over the course of time that becomes their journey and in this slide you can kind of see the design of that so that they they talk about what happened they talk about how they felt uh, and they can add little descriptions to it and this was our original design. Um, I hope you can kind of see that OK, where you have lots of these cards coming together uh, to present the student's journey. And again, you know, this is this kind of principle. It's simple, creative, uh, it's accessible. Uh, it started off as something where we were really thinking about disabled students, but actually we're now any student can do this and any student can benefit from it and enjoy it. Um, so it, it's got that principle in it as well. And there's a website there, uh, which is it's kind of the old version one now, but but that's freely available to play with and there's some resources there as well. Um, the actual uh, images and um, cards that we use to do this on paper are also there and, and openly licensed, so you can download those uh, and use it in a kind of workshop situation to think about students' journeys. 
And this is what we're now working on. There's a new version of this, uh, you know, much better design. We've had a lot of feedback about what uh, the tool should do, how it should be presented. So it's the same idea of creating a card, but it's a bit more informative, a bit more user friendly. Um, and again, there's, there's a, the new website there, the address is on the screen. I'll put it up again at the end. Um, and you know, if you look at that, you can have a play with it, you can register and um, have a look at this, this tool that we're creating. And yeah, there again, it's, it's the, the layout of cards so that people can uh, create their journey over time and we can look at that and see what's happened to them. So what is our journey for? I mean, this, is, this is one of the interesting things is doing this in a participatory way. We knew that this was something students like the idea of, um, but we, we were still kind of thinking, well, what, what is the purpose of our journey you know, for us and, and why are we pursuing it? And actually there's a, there's a few different reasons why this is interesting. Um, it's a reflective learning activity for students. So when students create their journeys, they're thinking about what's happened to them, um, the challenges, but also the achievements, how they've overcome challenges, uh, how they might behave in the future differently. Um, it does have the potential to give feedback to the institution. So we can collect journeys at scale now. And we're really only just starting to do this. We've done a trial with about 50 students and we have students in a, in a few of our courses using it. So we're building up to it, but, but it can give us a lot of feedback. Um, it could also enable this kind of dialogue and personal support. So we're thinking about, well, if the tutor can see the student's journey uh, or if support staff can see the student's journey, then they can help them. Um, and we're also, you know, interested in taking this out informally. You know, if you've got students who are, say, doing open education and things like that. Um, ah, okay, so there's a yeah, nice uh, question there from Rita. Um, uh, yeah, mentoring based on the journeys. Um, so, so what we've done so far is um, to embed this in a course. Uh, so it's like foundation students, so very early uh, in their studies. And um, at a level where we're trying to prepare them to get on with the degree. And in the first instance, it's an optional activity in a forum and they, they can share their journey in the forum and get some feedback on it, either from uh, tutors or other students. But we're now moving towards testing a model where the, the tutor is, is being um, trained. So, so each student has a tutor and their tutor is being trained to use our journey. And then they will use that with their group of students. Um, we haven't done it yet, but we're very you know, excited about the idea there. Um, so yeah, it, it, it is uh, the idea that can be mentoring um, and that might take different forms. It might be you have a large group of students and, and you know, an academic can see all the students' journeys or it might be it's more of a one-to-one -one thing. So, so yeah, as I said, there's, there's lots of potential of what our journey uh, can do and, and we're really exploring all of this and um, very welcome to talk to us about it if you're interested in using it. We're, we're getting it to the point where it's able to be used at scale by different groups. Um, and this all came out of starting by sitting down and working with uh, a disabled students group and saying, well, what are the sort of things you'd like us to do? And the other key thing that I'd like to introduce with our journey is we've always thought about accessibility, uh, technical accessibility of this uh, from the beginning. So whilst it for us it, it is exciting and innovative, underneath it all it's fairly standard building blocks of web technology. It's, it's forms, it's uh, structured information, and as we work through the project and we keep developing it, you know, we can keep testing it, we can ensure that it's open to everyone to use. Uh, we think about things like keyboard navigation through the tool, how screen readers will view it, and we run testing on it, and, and that continues throughout the project. And the key thing there is, you know, we're not thinking about this two years down the line and then having to figure out how to make it accessible. We're just doing that from the beginning. Again, that partly because of the audience we started with, it was always going to have to be accessible. Otherwise, we wouldn't be being responsible to that audience. But really, all projects should think about this stuff um, from an early stage. 
So that's really, I think, the Our Journey project is kind of um, embodying all three of those principles I, I started with. So kind of saying, well, we should start with audiences who face challenges and, and try and find those people who have problems that we want to work on. But then actually, we, we don't limit ourselves to those audiences. You know, we really kind of say, well, this might be a good thing for everyone. It might be, you know, not just a, a limited audience, but, but a really wide one. Think about creativity, but simple ways of encouraging people to contribute and share. And um, think about accessibility from the beginning of the process. So don't leave that to several years down the line. And, and really at this point, um, I, you know, I wonder whether people um, think these are the sorts of ideas that resonate with what they do. Um, I wonder if anybody has any thoughts that these are quite difficult things. Um, so, oh, okay, Antona, yeah. Um, the evaluation of all the initiatives. Okay, so they've always had um, what I suppose we'd call in the wild evaluation. So we've always tried to get them out in front of people and make them publicly available. And that's meant uh, in some cases uh, that's quite difficult. So when we started with Out There and In Here, as I said, technically it was hard. So we ran quite a few um, trials where we got groups of students and school children and all these other things. And we, we had to put in a lot of effort setting that up, whereas nowadays it wouldn't be so hard because mobile network technology is just much uh, better. Um, but we had um, you know, several groups and, and we could analyze how they interacted with it and the different learning that happened outdoors and indoors. Uh, with art maps, again, we did it publicly, so the website was there, and we collected a lot of data by having kind of challenges that we prompted people to um, to do certain things. Um, and with our journey, it's really again trying to get students using it. So we are doing trials where it, it's kind of controlled, and we have um, students doing surveys for us and things like that to make sure it's getting better. But yeah, I think our evaluation is always kind of about making it naturalistic and getting people involved. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I hope that helps, and but, it so. was really, really <laughs> engaging and interesting. There are so many things that uh, we could discuss starting from your uh, presentation today. I really hope that uh, uh, we can keep on uh reflecting on your on your inputs and i see the people typing and encouraging <laughs> mm. uh, you know to go on with uh, yeah, this yeah, work no, as good. you yeah. said we we met on, on a conference that was devoted to inclusion and accessibility mm. and the use of technology in a critical way to facilitate um inclusion within heritage and within cultural heritage so um this is the area where i think we should uh, uh more and more focus to to you know to be to develop certain citizenship skills that we really need uh in the contemporary world <laughs> unfortunately and so mm, I really yeah. thank you for being with us today. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but as I said, they, the um, recording uh, will be stored on our website and I hope, you know, other people, other uh, participants can access uh, this uh, uh, recording and maybe contact you. I will contact you for sure because I really hope there would be the opportunity to mm -hmm. to start a new cooperation together. So thank you. Yeah, thank you again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Great. I have one. Uh, yeah, this so this slide has some some contact details on there as well. And yeah, very happy if people want to email um, and. Uh, 
talk about the project Thank and it's you. lovely and to see the comments if you if you are available uh, are tonight uh, tonight in in a while actually in two hours in a couple of hours less than two hours we will have uh, a, an hidden chat on a project that is devoted to uh, very close uh, um, topics and content, the Digital Culture Project, which is a European project on the development of digital skills, the facilitation of the development of digital skills mm. in the creative industries uh, sector. Um, different partners are involved and so, you know, the, 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 the topic is very much close to, to this one and uh, uh, different, you know, uh, environments from different countries in Europe uh, will be uh, there and we will talk more about that. Thank you again, Tim. Have a nice uh, uh, winter break and let's be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all the people yes, that thank participated you. today. Thank you.